Well, wanting to welcome Caroline Hartzell uh, to uh, the SCAR Research Seminar. Um, I'm going to do uh, the usual sort of introduction of Caroline. She's the professor of political science of Get uh, at Gettysburg College. She's the founding director of the college's globalization studies program. Um, she's the co-author with her uh, longtime collaborator, Matt Hottie, of Crafting Peace, Power Sharing Institutions and the Negotiating the Settlement of Civil Wars, which uh, Dilfers will know well because she read it in Terrence's in my class. Uh, um, and she's the co-editor of, a co-editor of, also with Matt Hottie, of Strengthening Peace in Post-Civil War States, Transforming Spoilers into Stakeholders. Um, her work's been published in, in a lot of prominent journals. I'm going to read off a few of them. International Organization, the American Journal of Political Science, the International Studies Review, uh, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, and the Journal of Peace Research, um, amongst others. That's not all of them. Uh, she was a Fulbright Scholar in Colombia, where she conducted field research uh, on the economic impact of civil war on Colombia's subsequent economic development. Um, in 2010-2011, she was a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. Um, uh, and her research and policy work have also taken her to Afghanistan, um, where she worked to help Afghan stakeholders explore options for the Afghan peace process. Caroline holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, Davis. Um, and I also add two notes on, uh, on Caroline as well. Uh, she, uh, when she's uh, at Gettysburg College, I think Caroline is a really, really great example of how someone can be a, have a very dynamic research agenda while being at a liberal arts college where you're really focused on teaching. Uh, and, and so to see sort of uh, Caroline's work evolve, you know, it's really, really cool because I've seen her at political science conferences with undergraduate students in tow who are presenting their undergraduate research at a conference, which is just really, really cool. The other cool thing about this is um, uh, I first saw this work and sort of thought of inviting Caroline to, to present it here um, at the Peace Science Society conference, which uh, happens in November of every year. And um, she presented this work, and there was another a presentation on women in civil war by uh, Jakana Thomas and yeah, um, Kanisha Bond. Yeah, right. Sorry, uh, Jakana Thomas and Kanisha Bond was also sort of really interesting work. And Peace Science Society is, as you might ex sometimes expect from a bunch of statisticians, is can at times be uh, older and male and white. Uh, and it was very, very cool all of a sudden. For the first time that I can remember at Peace Science, we had presentations on gender and conflict at Peace Science. I thought it was very, very cool that that was happening, and I, was, I think that was a really good step forward for our field. So, uh, with uh, no more further introduction, uh, uh, here's Caroline Hartson. Thank you. I don't have a podium to hide behind here, so we'll have to see how this goes. Um, so thank you, Tom, for inviting me down here, and thanks uh, to all of you for um, turning out. This is a very much a work in progress, so what I'm really hoping for, too, is feedback from um, all of you uh, regarding um, questions. I, I'll even raise some questions at the end or throughout, so um, I'm, I hope you bear with me. Let's see, I might even turn this to face me the right way. Actually, I think I decided to use this. All right. Um, I thought I'd start a little by talking a little bit about why this study. Um, as Tom pointed out, for example, at Peace Science, uh, focus on gender and conflict is, is pretty new. Um, and this isn't to say that people haven't been focusing on gender and conflict. It was actually interesting to me when I went out and started looking among things, a, a growing feminist literature, for example, on this topic, um, a, a fair amount of work in terms of case studies, for example. Uh, but as I'll mention again later, um, I, I was sure that I was going to find that the questions I had in mind had already been done, at least done in the way that political scientists, you know, cross-national. And actually, they hadn't. So um, this was, you know, something I decided to keep uh, exploring. So in terms of motivations for the study, one of the things I've been interested for a, a, in, uh, for a long time is the potentially transformational nature of civil war. Um, certainly a good deal has been written about this in terms of in um, terms of um, war, not so so not so much intrastate war, but interstate war. People like Tilly, war makes a state, those kinds of arguments, right? So certainly there's this notion out there that war can be a transformative force. I think there's been a lot more reluctance to talk about civil war as a transformative force, and maybe that's just partly because of the nature of a civil war. It's a society sort of at each other, right? Um, but I do want to explore, and I'll talk a little bit more about this transformational potential of civil war. Um, as far as uh, the women's right part of it, what, what motivated me to do this? I mean, uh, frankly, women are half the population. They certainly bear worth focusing on, right? Um, also, and I start very much from this, this is a point a lot of the feminist, feminist literature makes, war has gendered impacts. So um, if we start from that, then why not look at what those gendered impacts are? 
Um, women's rights matter. And here we have growing evidence of this, that women's rights matter in a lot of important ways. They matter for development. All, you know, women invest more in their families, children have higher rates of education, all, you know, lots of growing literature on that. Um, there's a growing literature, and I, this was interesting to me because I started at this point and I thought, okay, so someone's done the arrow the other way. There's this growing literature on women's rights and conflict onset. So again, a, a number of studies have found that in countries where women, uh, women's rights suffer, right, uh, those have a higher likelihood of experiencing the onset of civil war. What was interesting to me then is no one has looked at it the other way. All right, so once you've had civil war, what is, it, uh, what is the effect on women's rights? Um, and women's rights also, there's some indications, some beginning, uh, some studies out there suggesting that maybe it matters for conflict recidivism. So if we care about civil wars, about not seeing them stop, start again, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe we should also care about women's rights. Um, the international community has also been paying growing attention to women's rights uh, in, with respect to conflict and especially civil wars. Uh, one example, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, which has a lot to say about this topic, a lot about the need, for example, to involve women in negotiations of peace settlements, um, peacekeeping forces, a whole a number of factors they focus on. Um, I was also, also interested in women's rights because um, women's rights seem particularly difficult to actually have, you know, to move them much, to make much of an effect on, right? Um, and so I thought that this, in a way, was a hard case for the transformative potential of civil war. If civil war is going to make some sort of difference, you know, we know it does for a lot of different things. We know Collier, for example, the, you know, the negative impacts on development, et cetera. Um, but, you know, given that it's so difficult to make much of a difference in terms of with moving women's rights along, I thought this would be a particularly interesting reason to look at it as well. And then again, um, a lot of the case studies out there, a lot of case study literature suggests um, that um, some, you know, really interesting things that might happen um, to women's rights as a result of civil war. I've taken students to Nicaragua a couple times for classes. One of them was a class on um, gender and development. And we lived with host families. Um, a lot of them were women-headed households. Um, and, you know, students talked to the women about their uh, experiences in the I mean, these were really strong women, many of whom talked about the transformative nature of civil war for them. Literacy had come out of their involvement with the Sandinistas, just a number of factors. Um, uh, Afghanistan, I met with this, some really amazing women there, heads of NGOs. I would say one difference between those two countries is the women I was talking to in Nicaragua uh, were very much, um, the women in, in Afghanistan were elite level women. They had left the country, for example, studied, many of them had master's degrees from abroad. Um, in Nicaragua, I was talking to women who, some of most of whom were just now literate, for example, educated at a primary school level. In both instances, though, you know, both, both sets of women were able to talk about how conflict had affected their lives um, negatively, yes, but also some uh, had, had enjoyed some positive um, changes in rights after that. Um, and then other literature, and I'll reference probably Rwanda later, um, East Timor, I don't know as much about, but I've started to do some interesting reading on um, some reading on some of the interesting effects there as well. Okay. So that just sort of by way of background uh, um, motivating me. All right. So um, my central question is what effect, if any, does civil rights have on women's rights? And I take two cuts at this question. All right. The first one is a very more, much more basic cut. Again, I was sure someone had done this, and no. So I kind of felt obliged to keep it in there. Um, I'm sort of toying with the idea of oh, actually only focusing this paper eventually on the second cut, but let me start with this, the first cut here. And that's just to ask, is there any significant difference in women's rights between countries that have civil wars and those that don't? All right, so um, I'll, let me just say these and then I'll get into each one a little bit more. And then the second cut is to ask whether there are certain aspects of civil wars. Um, for example, the severity of the civil war, the way the civil war ends. Um, the terms that are uh, negotiated during the Civil War, whether peacekeeping forces go or not, et cetera. Um, are there certain aspects of civil wars that, that, that it's those that have the potential to affect women's rights in a post-conflict environment, all right? Um, and then I kind of, with respect to that, clearly civil wars differ in nature, so it's not likely they're gonna have a uniform effect on, on women's 
Okay. Um, a little bit on women's rights. Um, there are lots of different ways to think of this. Um, there are some empirical studies on civil war that look at things like um, in, uh, certain women, some outcomes related to gender. So effects on health, that's been an issue that has been studied uh, with um, a, fi a fair amount, a growing amount now of literature on the effect, on the gendered effects of civil war on health, for example, or on education. Um, I wanted something that gets a little bit more kind of an, it, my, my notion is that institution, institutional change might have an impact on things like that, whether women do get uh, access to health care or not. Um, and so I wanted to come closer to something that kind of conceptually is more like an institution. So I focus on this concept of women's rights. I use the Singrinelli Richard um, human rights data set, which has lots of different human rights measures in it, including measures for women's political, economic, and social rights. Um, and the Siri measures look at government, so what are women's rights in there? Um, government respect for internationally recognized human rights, including the women's rights. It focuses on the extensiveness of laws pertaining to each set of rights and government practices towards women or how effectively the government enforces the laws. So what are the laws and to what extent is the government actually enforcing those laws? All right, so with respect to these rights. Just a little bit more on the coding of this measure. Um, uh, just to give you a sense of this, um, women's political rights, for example, include a number of in, um, internationally recognized rights, such as the right to vote, the right to run for political office, the right to hold elected and appointed government positions, the right to join political parties, the right to petition government officials, women's economic rights, equal pay for equal work, um, the right to be free from sexual harassment in the workplace, the right to work at night the right to uh, choose a profession or employment without needing your husband or male relative's permission. Um, so a number, there are a number of other ones there. And really quickly, also women's social rights, right to equal inheritance. That's an interesting one with respect to Rwanda, for example. That did change um, after the genocide. The right to enter into basis, uh, marriage on a basis of equality with men. The right to um, participate in social, cultural, and community activities, the right to an education, and several more. These are scored 0, 1, 2, 3, all right? Um, a ver if, a, if a right in a country year is scored 0, so say uh, some country in some year the right is scored 0, that means there are no rights for the women, uh, for women in the law, and or that systematic discrimination based on sex has been built into the law. A score of one means there's some rights under the law, but they're not effectively enforced. Two means that there are um, some rights that are guaranteed in law, and the government may be enforcing them to some extent, but still allows some discrimination or still um, uh, prohibits certain laws in practice, not on the books, but in practice. Three means nearly all rights are guaranteed by law, and they have been vigorously enforced in practice. So that's just a little bit of background then on the um, rights measure I'm using. Okay, so here's the first cut at this question. Um, and again, this is just asking, if you look at all countries, some have civil wars, some don't, should we expect that um, the ones that have civil wars, should, what kind of impact would you expect to see for that? <coughs> so there's very little out there, and I think um, probably because people don't want to say or don't want to think that civil war could somehow have, you know, it's kind of disturbing to think about this potentially having positive rights uh, impacts, for example. So it's actually really hard to find anything on this question. Um, so here's what I dug up. Um, negative impact on, on rights. Well, if you look at the literature on human rights, and there is a, 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 a lot of that's been written on this, a big empirical literature on it. Um, for example, very well known uh, piece, Poe, Tate and Keith, Poe wrote a lot on civil wars, um, uh, sorry, on human rights. Um, they just, they note that governments are more likely to repress human rights in the face of threats to the regime. So if that set of human rights, you know, from that I think you can derive the idea that it must be true for women's rights as well. If governments feel threatened by women's activities, that they'll repress their rights, right, during the course of a war. Uh, increased militarization of society. This is something Cynthia Enlow has written about. And here the notion is that in the course of a war, probably the hardcore people come to power. Um, and that with everything associated with that, you know, the military instead of the police force, et cetera, that that's going to also lead to repression of rights. And she actually does talk more about effects on women specifically. All right. 
Uh, positive impact on rights. Um, and this is just this idea that, well, maybe these negative, these, these institutions that repress women's rights actually fall apart during a civil war, right? They dissolve or they're reshaped, um, including institutions like uh, those of patriarchy. Um, and this can happen, for example, as during a war, women take on rules of interacting with the state because men are off fighting, because men have been killed, or because men are jailed. And Elizabeth Wood, um, for example, focuses on that, especially with respect to the conflict in El Salvador, where, where women did become the main interlocutors with the state um, during, that, during the Civil War there, or an important set of interlocutors with the state, right? Um, so that was the first cut, right? That was just saying, all right, look at all countries. If, if some have a civil war, what's the effect, right? Uh, and then here's the second cut. Um, do differences among civil wars matter? Here again, there actually are more. It's easier from the literature to actually find hypotheses or things that kind of approximate hypotheses. They're very much competing hypotheses, though. I did decide in each case to, to plump for, for, a, for a directional hypothesis, all right? So for example, uh, and this is probably the grimmest one, intensity of violence. So here I'm hypothesizing that the more intense the civil war is, that that will actually have a positive impact on women's rights after the civil war. Um, why? Mostly, or the main rationale I have for this is a demographic change, all right? What is a demographic change? more men are killed during civil wars because they're still, even though there are countries where women increasingly have participated as fighting forces in civil wars, they are still the primary fighting forces, all right? Um, and the possibility this suggests is that, simply put, there's more space for women in political and economic realms after a civil war. Um, a case that there is some literature on with respect to this, or this argument has been made with respect to, is Rwanda. Um, and how that may have motivated government. So where you're talking about that after the end of the genocide, about 70 to 80 percent of the population then between the deaths and male imprisonment um, was, um, for the immediate post-war years, was female. Mediation. Um, again, a, a lot of contending kind of ideas about this. One of the more interesting quotes I have in the paper refers to uh, mediators are mostly men. It's very, very difficult actually to see, to find any um, female mediators in the literature, but this is so, those involved in mediating civil wars. Um, one uh, feminist um, uh, article referred to mediators as cowboys uh, and with everything that sort of negatively implied, right? So the notion is that when they come, when they're at the table, and first of all, women aren't at the table, by and large, I mean, large, right? That women aren't at the table. Uh, but that mediators neglect uh, women's rights issues, for example, or that they're focusing on bargains that ultimately end up com um, compromising women's rights, right? So uh, I go with the idea that um, if mediators have been involved in uh, the bar, you know, ending the war, um, that that's likely to have a negative effect on women's rights. Power sharing measures. Um, again, a growing um, kind of debate on this, um, where some argue that power sharing uh, measures are going to have a negative impact on women. Um, again, because women aren't being represented at the table where these power sharing measures are generally crafted. Um, and some people arguing, this was an interesting, um, recent, very recent article, for example, um, noting that there's been a remarkable trend in the last few years in terms of the presence of references to gender and women's rights in power sharing arrangements. So this is a new twist now on power sharing, that gender is actually being included as part of it. Um, so anyway, I go ahead and hypothesize that uh, power sharing will have a positive impact if power sharing measures are included as a way of ending the Civil War. It's going to have a pow positive impact, um, it, partly because what power sharing is trying to do is generally include previously excluded groups. Um, and even though women generally aren't at the table, for example, maybe this has some sort of spillover effect to gender. Oops. Okay. There. <laughs> uh, a couple, a few more variables, really quickly here. Uh, peacekeeping operations. Here, I showed you a little bit more of the kind of contending hypotheses on it. Uh, Cross-national studies on peacekeeping and human rights, not gender rights, but human rights, finds that uh, peacekeeping can both encourage and weaken respect for human rights. 
peacekeepers can improve government's right. For, so here are some of the sort of mechanisms that peace pe peacekeepers can improve government right performance by transmitting information. Uh, peacekeepers may model positive gender relations and in that way affect the government's attitude and respect for human rights. Peacekeeping forces may mean there's an increased spotlight on government's respect for human rights, including gender rights. Um, I go ahead and hypothesize um, out of all this that we may, can expect peacekeeping operations to have a positive effect on women's rights. And then finally, a lot of people have pointed out that gains that women do make in civil war seem to erode over time. So Nicaragua is a case in point. Um, there's a very famous book, Sandino's Daughters, where, um, again, a lot of the women that participated in the conflict had very, very, very high expectations for post-war, post-conflict post Nicaragua, post-Sandinista Nicaragua. Then a few years later, there's a, a very kind of uh, less exciting, I don't mean less exciting book, but a disheartening book, Sandino's Daughters Revisited, where the author of Sandino's Daughters um, re interviews again many of these women, and they're just, you know, it, it, some of them are downright despairing at how much um, the hopes they had and some of the rights they'd actually achieved had actually eroded with the passage of time. Um, so a number of people um, write about this uh, notion that um, with the passage of time, those rights, if there were improvements, you should expect maybe to see them erode. Uh, some control variables. Again, the first two are um, just using basically every model of human rights. So the richer a country is, the more democratic it is, the more respect for human rights. Well, I expect that that will have an impact as well then on women's rights. Uh, the last two have been uh, used more in looking at, more specifically, at women's rights issues, um, although not with respect to civil war and women's rights, but this notion that economic globalization, this is actually a very contentious one, of course, right? Uh, but Richards and Galeni uh, find evidence that economic globalization has a positive effect on women's rights. And then the CEDAW, this is a Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, so if countries have signed on onto the CEDAW, Greg Hiddleston and Sam Holtz find that it should have a, a you know, it has a positive effect on women's rights. Whoops, went too far. Okay, uh, really quickly, the method. No. It will interest you, Tom, right? <laughs> I'm always. <laughs> Not sure if anyone else, but uh, uh, panel time series data sets. Um, the Siri data set doesn't start till 1981, so I can't start. I look at the period 1981 to 2007. Uh, so for the first cut, all states in the international system, over 500,000 in population. Um, are, are what I look at, and for the second cut, I look only at countries that have fought and ended civil wars between 1981 and 2007. Um, given the nature of the dependent variable, I use an ordered probit, um, and how many of you are really deeply interested in statistical issues here? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have the I paper. You can, right, right, exactly. Well, so, I, you know, just um, controls for autocorrelation, time, one year lag. Um, and then I would just point out that in Model 2, I do control for what the level of women's rights was before the Civil War, right? Um, I, I was really wanting to actually calculate change in rights, but I can't because the, the dependent variable is scored 0, 1, 2, 3, and it's not a linear model, so I can't just say, ooh, it was a 3 before, and now it's a 2 now, and I'll just subtract and get a 1 because I can't do that. So the so I do still though try to control for what I do control for what the level of rights was before the war. All right, so this is the first cut. This is uh, the kind of more you know simple model here where we're just saying if a country had a civil war, what effect did it have on political, economic, and social rights? Um, and you can see that it has a negative effect um, on all of those rights, although it's only statistically significant. Um, especially for economic rights, barely significant for social rights. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Do I, am I pointing the right way? Yeah, okay. Um, some of the standard, you know, yeah, democracy, do, not on political rights, but it's still positive. Economic globalization on political rights, not on the others. Income matters for a couple of different sets of rights. This one I think is really interesting, um, the CEDAW. Uh, so signing on, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, signing on. Um, uh, well, I'll just say it now. Um, signing on does seem to have some influence, 
Um, the one issue I would point out here is probably some sort of selection effect, right? So if you're more inclined to sign on to the CDAW, you're probably more inclined to respect women's rights. Um, so uh, high N here, I point that out only because when I get to the next model, you'll see how much the N drops. Um, all right, so this is now just focusing on countries that had civil wars, ended civil wars, what happens to women's rights after the end of the civil wars, all right? The end drops because now I'm looking at fewer countries, only those that had civil wars. It also drops because I can only look at periods after civil war. Some countries fight a civil war, end a civil war. I can look at women's rights after it. Then they start another civil war. I take them out during the time they're fighting the civil war, and then I can only look at them again in the post-civil war years. So that really narrows down my end. Um, the other thing I would point out, see the, the social rights, num the end for social rights drops. Siri retired that variable in 2005, so I have a smaller end for it. Also, they seem to have scored social rights less often, less frequently than the other two sets of rights. So there's more, there are fewer years with social rights scores. Um, so just to put that into context. Okay. So what do we find here? Um, let me focus, these are again more the control variables. Uh, sort of the one grim finding, yeah, the more intense a civil war is, um, the better off women's rights are following the end of the civil war, right? Uh, for Especially for political rights, uh, not as significant for economics, pretty significant up, uh, level uh, for social rights as well. Mediation, the only time that this variable is positive um, is for economic rights, and it, mediators have a negative effect on women, um, on women's economic. The participation of mediators in a civil war leads to negative effects for women uh, in terms of economic rights after the civil wars end. Peacekeeping forces, uh, positive effect on terms of uh, economic rights. That's the only variable that's significant. It is negatively signed for political rights. Power sharing measure, positive for political and economic. Uh, really quickly, in the political rights model, I include a variable for political power sharing. In the economic rights model, I include a variable for economic power sharing. Seems to make sense. Social rights, well, there's no social power sharing uh, variable. I tried it a couple different ways. When I ran it here, I used the economic power sharing. I also tried it with political power sharing. I also tried just power, you know, number of power sharing, because I code for four different types of power sharing. I also tried just the number. The higher the number, it does have an effect. Um, but I went with the, this is more intuitively obvious, I think. Time since settlement, not significant. Um, uh, negatively signed only in the case of economic rights. And prior level of women's rights um, does matter for the economic rights. Um, okay. Discussion, so really, again, back to the table one results. Um, so the title of this paper was Scourge or, or Source of Potential Transformation. Um, so certainly table one suggests civil war is a scourge um, in the sense that if you have a war, it's bad for women's rights. Uh, we had significant and negative effect for women's economic and social rights. I already talked a little bit about the CDAW variable. Simmons suggests, you know, this goes along with what she's written on women's rights, that, you know, international law can have positive effect on women's rights. Um, again, maybe that's a result of selection effects. Uh, the control for autocorrelation suggests that if you've had a higher level of respect for women's rights in the past, you're more likely uh, to have a um, higher respect for women's rights after the Civil War. Makes sense. Um, reverse causality. It, maybe that's, though, partly what's going on here. Civil wars are more likely to take place. We already have evidence in places where um, women's status is low. So maybe we're just seeing kind of this, you know, magnified onward. Table two. This suggests that some civil wars, or at least some aspects of civil wars, could have transformative effects on women's rights. So it's both scourge and source of transformation, I would say, civil war. Uh, the intensity variable. Um, what I can't tell is it is whether this result comes from the demographic effects of civil war, whether the fact that it's a lot of men dying in particular, 
Um, or maybe even, maybe there's some psychological shock effect associated with more intense civil wars. Maybe people say, oh, wow, you know, we need to make some changes, and somehow that redounds to women's rights. I don't know what's driving that uh, result. Power sharing, um, again, this positive effect. Um, that's really interesting, though, because I didn't take gendered aspects into, of power sharing measures into account because I don't have data on them. I just used my power sharing measures. Um, so it raises an interesting question. Why does power sharing have this effect, right? Um, probably most of these um, um, settlements that I scored for power sharing through 2007, probably most of them were not including gendered effects in them for power sharing. Um, time since settlement, not significant, okay. Um, women's political, oh, here are a couple different points. The negative coefficient on economic rights is not um, significant, but it's kind of interesting. It suggests that economic rights could erode after the end of a conflict. Um, women's political rights have generally been trending upward with time, all right? Irrespective of, of civil war or anything, women's political rights have generally been showing a, a, a you know, a slow upward trend. Um, and I think this reflects the fact that this, in the international arena, there's been so much emphasis on things like gender quotas for um, elections and the like, right? Um, so, but, and then the other interesting point about social rights is they're just really low to begin with. If you look at the series scores, the set that women have consistently the lowest scores on are women's social rights. So uh, essentially, they have nowhere to go but up. Uh, next steps. Um, so I, I was trying to sit here and think about what would people ask me so? Um, and this, some of this comes out of the peace science um, feedback I got too. All right, what about the means by which a civil war ended? If it end, does it matter whether it ended in military victory negotiated settlement? And I don't initially start include by including that because I think one problem with using those as variables is that they were always meant to be proxies for the type of set for the type of settlement arrived at at the end of a civil war, and a lot of the variables I include in here already disaggregate that. So, in other words, negotiated settlements, yeah, they're the ones that mostly have power sharing, right? So, if I've already included power sharing in there, why would I want to use something kind of more crude like the way the civil war ends? But everyone always asks about it, so I ran it. Um, um, both are insignificant, but positively signed for political rights. Both have a negative effect on economic rights, although negotiated settlement uh, variable is significant at just the point one level. Military victory is positively signed. Negotiated settlement negatively signed. Neither significant for social rights. I also, and this is ultra wanky, this came out of peace science, I also use a hyperbolic transformation, <laughs> because isn't it fun to say that, right? Um, to discount the effects of conflict outcomes over time. I went ahead and tried this, even though I still don't think conflict outcomes is the right variable to put in here. Um, the only significant effect I got out of that was that military victory had a positive effect on uh, economic rights. I don't know why I put the word social, uh, economic rights and social rights at the P1 level. Point one level, sorry. What about um, UNSC Resolution 1325? Um, so I added this post-1325 dummy variable um, to see whether, again, there's been a lot of a talk, a lot of attention to 1325 and a number of follow-up resolutions to it, too. So has this made a difference? Um, it was insignific insignificant, positively signed for political and social rights, negatively signed for economic rights. I think it's just too crude a variable, though, it, you know, saying here's where they signed it, you know, from this point on has the fact of of 1325 not signed, but of passing it made a difference. I think I would need to sort of disaggregate that variable more, fine tune it more to get, um, to see if it actually had an effect. I haven't in in controlled for social variations. This came up at Peace Science. So the only thing I could think of, the only data I had available was to add a control for a percentage of the Muslim population with the notion that others have argued that that could have an effect on women's rights. It only has a significant effect on economic rights. And then um, one thing I haven't done at all, and if you have any suggestions, is so what about the regime that comes to power? I mean, you know, there's some the real differences between the Taliban and the Sandinistas, for example, right? So, and I have no way at, at getting at some type of measure that allows me to distinguish in some meaningful way between among those kinds of differences. So that's it. <laughs>
So no? the way uh, the way our seminar has been going is uh, uh, someone is a discussant and sort of discuss the paper a little bit, and then we sort of take questions from our audience. Uh, uh, I appointed myself discussant, uh, so uh, so um, I just have a sort of a few comments. And Caroline, I'm going to try to uh, write some of this up and sort of send it to you, so that it might be uh, more useful. Uh, actually ma managed to be a little bit more cogent than I'll be now. Um, so, so warning, I may not be. Uh, okay, so um, I think Caroline's work is asking a big uncomfortable question, right? Um, and if you, th if you think about sort of the way that places like Escar were founded, they were founded on the normative idea uh, that the sorts of wars that Caroline is studying here um, are sort of have an unmitigated set of negative effects on human life. Um, and, and Caroline is, is being sort of, both sort of brave enough, right, but also sort of willing to ask this, this uncomfortable question of whether there may actually be, in terms of human rights, in terms of women's rights, positive, in, positive impacts of conflict, positive impacts of war in the post-war environment. And this is sort of a question that, that Dillifrews and Lindsay and I and Terrence and other people in Conflict 695 sort of are constantly thinking about, right? Are there, are there you know, sort of, is, this, is this actually a possibility? So sort of broaching that topic, I think, it is, 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 is a good one. And I think perhaps sort of depending on sort of where the study goes, right, it's sort of a needed, a needed corrective to the rather understandably dark narrative of the impact of civil war in human life, right? Uh, and so trying to understand, I guess, a very, very big question, right, and a very, very big topic. So I, I really like that about sort of what, what Caroline's presenting to us today. Um, I'd also sort of add uh, um, that the, this connects really, really well to a lot of exciting things that are happening here at SCAR and at George Mason on the topic of women in conflict. So Leslie Dwyer, um, uh, and I think I mentioned her name to you, Caroline, this is an anthropologist here uh, um, who has started a center on, on women in civil war along with uh, Sandra Cheldolin. Uh, San Sandra, you know, Sandy just came out with a, a book, just a, an edited volume, just about a year or two ago, on sort of women waging war and waging peace is the name of the edited volume in which a lot of case studies, that might be great fodder for you, Caroline, about sort of the, the, impact of, uh, uh, the impact of war on women's lives. Um, so it's a very, very sort of kind of cool links to our work. So, so I, I, I really love the question. I think it's a good time to be presenting it. Uh, presenting it here. So I have a couple sort of, I have a couple statistical questions I'm not going to sort of, <laughs> that I, we can talk about sort of pri privately. I think we have the two statisticians at SCAR are in the room. Uh, uh, so, so uh, but I'll, uh, I'll sort of uh, uh, so just point out just a couple of, uh, a couple of quick sort of things and th thinking about the project. Um, okay, so the first kind of major question I have um, is the idea of what's a dependent variable, right? Uh, um, so what, what are you trying to explain? In, in, uh, and so, the the, the the Siri data, right, sort of are sort of well known, right? Their ability to sort of actually quantify. And this is a good sort of object lesson for our students. Bless you. It is the ability to quantify things that we usually think of as being unquantifiable, like right? The status of women in society, for example. Um, and I think that the Siri data are very very cool, right? So they allow us to take a quantitative look at this thing, um, in which we wouldn't otherwise. But I want to kind of go back to conceptual underpinnings for a second to think about what you're really about here. Right, and I'm going to start by thinking about Cuba for a second. Right, so Cuba is sort of, might be sort of a, we can definitely think of Cuba as being a transformative war in a lot of different ways. Right, in terms of women's rights, the Cuban regime comes to power and expands women's rights at least formally. Uh, um, uh, but I believe I'm going to get the, the timing of this wrong. So minds like to these days. But I think sort of the first wo woman joined the Central Committee of the Cuban government in like 1986. It was 26 years after the Civil War. Ended. Right, no, sorry, 27 years after this award. No, actually, 28 years after this award. Um, so, so, so that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? So what conceptually are you looking at? And what we are thinking about it, and what the Siri data are actually capturing, are the de jure status of women in society. Um, and, and that's a good thing, when we want that to be better rather than worse. Uh, um, and, and in particular, right, it's the, a state-centric view of what women's rights in society actually are in that it's saying what are what are sort of the legally encoded rights of women as captured by this government by this state um, but sort of the, so by any by that measure right the Cuban government greatly expanded women's rights by another measure the Cuban government didn't right the Cuban revolution didn't in the sense that it actually also uh, um, it didn't actually expand women's participation in politics in meaningful ways um, so women had more political rights than they would have, and of course I'm thinking about political rights here, right? Uh, but they, but they didn't capture political power. They did sort of 
do as much to capture political participation, right, as part of the revolution. And that's in part uh, um, uh, not just sort of about sort of political participation in Cuba writ large, right, but even within the party, women were not as big, were not playing as big of a role within the party as they might have, right. So, so that to me sort of gets at this issue of the de jure status of women versus the de facto political status of women. Uh, social rights are essentially, I think of as being sort of de facto rather than de jure, uh, um, right? But sort of, so what are the actual de facto conditions? Are, are women post-conflict actually more likely to participate in politics? Um, I actually think that's a question that plays more to the strengths of the project in the sense that, that sort of, uh, my guess is, and the, your logic in a sense about sort of the impact of the loss of many men in society, right? We can think about sort of the suffrage woman the movement uh, in, in Europe, you know, sort of right after World War I, right? So, there were no men uh, of a particular generation. So, so I think it plays to the strengths of the project in the sense that what we should see are expanding patterns of women's participation. Now, I'm not entirely sure how that will always show up in a de jure measure of women's rights as encoded by, I'm assuming, constitutions and in laws and so on. So, so that's sort of something that immediately came to mind is sort of what's the dependent variable where are you actually sort of trying to trying to explain? It's just, I don't, that's not something easily captured in sort of in, in the data and so on, so it's not it's not an easy thing to do. But just to take a couple sort of tangible things, right? What are the, what's the probability that you actually have a woman leader, right? Uh, I, I think the, the a lesson of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia and the, in, in sort of the, the aftermath of the Civil War is a great example of the fact that sort of you know she had run before and lost, and then she wins the second time, right? Where so, you know a bunch of people basically say maybe we should you know hire the no you know the the future Nobel Prize winning. Harvard trained economist <laughs> to run the country, right? Uh, um, and so, and maybe that has, and make that, and maybe that is a gender decision, right? Uh, um, so, do you have a woman, you know, women in the legislature? There's a, there are new data on this about sort of how many women are in a democratically elected parliaments mm -hmm. and things like that. So, those would be interesting ways because I think your argument is more about women's political participation. I'm, I'm a political scientist, so I'm thinking about political things, right? More about women's political participation as much as it is about their jury status. Um, though obviously your results are showing that there are sort of some effects, um, some effects there. Um, the sort of the other thing, actually, you've already mentioned this, so I'm, I'm just going to sort of uh, beat it on uh, potentially already dead horse, uh, 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 um, which is the idea of um, why women's status in society change after war, um, and and one of the things you sort of pointed out at the end of of, of, this, uh, of the presentation. Right, that this may be because regimes, other things are changing, right? So, sort of the classic sort of resource designy uh, way we talk about these things. It might be that something else changes after civil war that also changes women's rights, but it's not that civil war is directly affecting uh, the women's rights. And and the overwhelming status, may, the overwhelming sort of answer to that question, of course, you know my work on this. So, sort of, uh, uh, I'm going to be a little bit biased here. Is that well, country, countries democratize after civil wars. This is the overwhelming response since the early 1990s. Post-Civil War countries, particularly ones with UN PKOs, democratize. Or at the very least, they hold a very fast election and then the UN leaves. Right? Uh, um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if part of what's going on is that the, you're getting some of the results you're getting because women's status in society at least temporarily goes up um, because there's a, sort of a very quick UN supported, international community supported liberalization of the official rules of society, right? Um, and so I would sort of, that's both a methodological question, right? But it's also a theoretical one. Sort of is, is the, the sort of the causal story you want to tell, right? This is an alternative to the main, one of the main causal stories you tell, the sort of, with, which is, you know, this is the, the grisly one, right? The sort of, the loss of men is sort of raises the status of women. A different one of these is that political regimes change after civil wars, and that changes in the status of women in society. So this is sort of an alternative sort of theoretical sort of apparatus uh, to sort of think about uh, uh, what you're thinking. So, okay, so there's a couple quick comments, and I have others for you, uh, um, uh, but we can sort of think about those, and I know, so I'll hopefully have a chance to read this again in the future, so. Um, so that leaves um, a room for people to be asking questions of Caroline themselves. So um, you can just recognize yourself, and maybe introduce yourself, and, and see um, what you'd like to ask. So anyone would like to get us started? I'm Lindsay. I'm a master's student here at SMR. Um, one of the questions that I, I have two questions, but the first one is about kind of your coding mm -hmm. and what you counted as a civil war. Like, did you was it a determination that you made, or was it 
something that someone else made, or how did you define that? Uh, so I have a data set on civil wars and power sharing, and I started with that as the basis, and I and I use a standard correlates of war level. So I don't do the twenty five; I do the thousand. Oh, and then, yeah, my other question was: I was I was really interested in this in terms of a uh, something that you found when you were talking about that during the mediation that women's rights women aren't at the table and so women's rights aren't part of the focus one of the things you said was that women's rights are compromised in like on behalf of the peace agreement i was wondering if you could talk about that and give an example of that so that's an argument that um some some um feminist studies, for example, on conflict and uh, gender and conflict have made um, that uh, the, the, some of the agreements that are made are ones that are going to compromise women's interests. Um, I think especially the, the, they seem to focus a lot there on um, economic rights. So women become heavily involved in the economy during a war, um, you know, extra burdens on them because of that and everything, but the notion is that participation in formal markets can also be a way to get recognition and get more rights and, um, and that one of the things that happens at the negotiating table is that this greater participation by women is just virtually ignored um, and so when you make agreements on dividing up for example in terms of power sharing maybe uh, different forms of economic power sharing women are totally sidelined or totally marginalized or the kinds of arrangements you uh, you, you make like divvying ministries that you get the diamonds you know that kind of thing um, just works to the detriment so that would be the kind of argument. Others? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. My name is Ted Sushi, I'm a PhD, and I'm also affiliated with the uh, genocide, the field of genocide study. And uh, I was fascinated by the topic of the demographic change in the case. And then uh, I can uh, imagine two different kinds of uh, responses. Those people who are considered genocide to be different from uh, civil war. Mm -hmm. And others, uh, more recent uh, trends in uh, genocide studies where uh, people see genocide as part of a broader spectrum of political violence. Mm -hmm. So the latter camp, uh, I would imagine that they would find this interesting uh, to, to see the uh, trends of uh, civil war. But looking from uh, also uh, this uh, former camp, mm -hmm. where uh, people see that maybe we would actually want to distinguish genocide from civil wars, that maybe if I had it coded for an event called genocide, of course there aren't that many, arguably, right? But if I had coded for that, that maybe genocide as a variable um, would have a distinguishable impact from civil war as a variable. Um, and yes, that too, and uh, also uh, uh, the, you're looking at the cases uh, the, and then I would consider that there are people in the genocide field who consider their cases not necessarily as civil right. but political ones. Right. And then, uh, right. So you have a, uh, there's a. I'm sure there would. Yeah. And you know there are debates regarding those. I mean, um, in the civil war literature, as essentially as long as there was some effective resistance by the other side, it gets coded as a civil war. So that would be why the case of Rwanda, despite people who study civil wars, is considered a civil war because there was at least enough effective resistance on the other side that 
big, big catch. I mean, the, you know, it's kind of nicky to be talking about coding rules with respect to this stuff, but it, by those coding rules, it, it fits the case of, of civil war. So um, that's why it's in there. It's in, it's in almost every civil war data set that I know of. That's true. I mean, I think what Katsushi's point brings up maybe is that, that there are also sort of ways of thinking about sort of like, for example, one-sided political right. violence, sort of its impact. And there, there are more right. cases of that if we don't start, if we, if we just think of one-sided violence opposed to genocide, right? Sort of, you know, we can debate sort of whether a particular case is a genocide or not, but sort of there is also one-sided political violence that may also shift the patterns right. in ways here. So, but so that, that would be interesting. To, I mean, one could expand this too to larger Set of, of types of political violence, right? And then look at, and so this might be interesting, maybe distinguish between civil wars, genocide, you know, or civil wars, one sided violence, and see if that has any effect. I started with civil wars uh, because, I don't know, this seemed like a pretty big undertaking enough uh, at this point, but I think that is an interesting point to say there are many different types of political violence, and it might be interesting to see whether those different types of political violence have different impacts on women's rights. Um, I'm you know, still wrestling with the question of the transformative potential for, for civil war. So um, I think that's a pretty big question, so I'm just going to start with that focus right now. But I think, you know, good graduate student projects, someone can brought in <laughs> right. different types There's of someone political violence. Someone in 695, for example. And it would be really neat to be able to see what effect that had. And then the other presentation, um, they are on you know, this massive undertaking right now of coding for yeah. women's participation in civil wars. Yeah. Um, so someday that data will exist. Um, it doesn't now. Uh, I don't think I want to wait till it exists. But um, <laughs> the other thing that's interesting about what you said about women's agency is, as Elizabeth Wood, for example, writes that one of the ways that civil war, one of the effects transformative effects of civil war can be that, um, you know, as women, for example, have to step up and interact with the state, but just the number of organizations that women form as a result of civil war. Sometimes there's sort of survival mechanisms, right? So uh, this is a little bit different, but it, this is more in reaction to structural adjustment. La, La Olla Comunal in, in Peru, for example, and in Bolivia, where women didn't have enough yeah. food, so they'd all take the communal, get a communal pot and throw in and feed their children that way, right? So, you know, their economic necessity out of structural adjustment prompted that, but sort of the notion that civil war, um, but then, it, you know, again, that that is a product of civil war. So again, that's sort of the transformative effects of civil war. So another cool variable would be something like how many women's organizations get formed as a result of civil war. Well, you know, again, that's a future graduate student's task to, <laughs> to look at. There's forever it's worth, I, um, I don't know if we, we read this, so Bari, I, I keep on looking at my students at 695, uh, so, so Bari and, and Dillard and Lindsay, but, but, uh, uh, but you know, there's uh, Chris Blattman's work on the survey, survey the work Uganda? in Uganda, yeah. right? so, you know, one of the things that they end up finding, in, yeah, I think Blattman and a non-fine race, is sort of, you know, ex-combatants feel actually a larger 
sense of political responsibility. They're more likely to vote, more likely to visit political offices and people or something, something like that. I'd be just interesting, I, I don't know if they say anything about this, but it'd be interesting to see if that's differentiated by gender. Well, so they did right? do a study on gender, too, point. and what they find, is that they had slightly different questions, but what they find is sort of this notion um, that uh, women are more victimized by civil war doesn't hold. Uh, for, for what they focused on. So again, you know, I feel like some yeah. of what I'm asking is really disturbing, but again, if not the transformative potential of the Civil War in a positive way, perhaps not. You know, a lot of the feminist literature talks about women's resilience, women's agency, stop using the word victim all the time with respect to women in Civil War. So, uh, you know, I, I know I'm asking really, really difficult questions, but um, uh, but I, but you know, and I don't think the only way trans civil war is transformative, by the way, is because lots of men die. I, I mean, the good news, I, I hope, is <laughs> the only way, right? But I think these other, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff going on, not just because of the civil war, but again, I'm looking at not just the civil. War. I only have one. I, I also, by the way, ran this for a duration of civil war too, um, and the only thing it has a positive impact on is women. Um, it has a slightly uh, not very significant, but still significant positive impact on political rights. Um, but, um, you know, there, I'm lot, asking a lot of other questions, I, like the peacekeeping, right? Um, and, and I'm saying it's, I'm hypothesizing, given what others have said, that it will have overall a positive effect, but it actually doesn't do that much, does it? And actually, at Peace Science, people hypothesize that the negative, uh, sorry, the positive impact that it did have on, on economic rights might come more out of this, this whole peace industry that arises yeah. in these countries as, as they're there for months and maybe years, right? Um, so, you know, other things like the way the war and uh, sorry, do, do, you know, do you have power sharing measures as part of it, etc. I mean, there are lots of different ways, I think, in which civil war can transform, not just because it kills a bunch of people, but it kills a bunch of men, right? Also, the other interesting thing about civil wars is women then die at higher rates after civil war than men. Um, and that's why I kind of put the psychological thing up there too, because th that's true. But you know, does that really get as much attention as the people that died during the Civil War, of course, the women? Um, and and you know, there's you know, what has the bigger shock factor, maybe, and thus ability to get governments to actually change rules, etc. I don't think the fact that women died in large measure after Civil Wars is getting more attention, but more by scholars and NGOs and and the like than necessarily a government saying, well, damn, we better change our ways and give women better rights now, right, because sure. of this. I saw a question over here. Yeah. Oh, and that makes it public. Oh, hi, Melissa. I'm an affiliate with the Gender Center here at SCAR. And uh, I'm sorry, I think I've come in a little bit late. I'm curious, my, my project actually looks at like, the role of masculinity and the ways in which women's chastity is used to foment and then justify violence in civil wars. So for example, the partition of India and Pakistan, how uh, these narratives were used by elite actors to say, you know, these heathen Muslims or these heathen Hindus are going to come rape your, your wives and your daughters. That was used as a, um, a justification and a, and a rallying cry to whip up a frenzy on the grassroots and get grassroots level actors to carry out you know, uh, actions that really benefited elite actors. I'm wondering um, if you can speak to that a bit more. Is that something that came up in your research? Is that something you've looked at? No, it isn't. I mean, I do think one thing about the, the whole power sharing variable is that generally I think that it's very elite focused, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's more at the end of a war. Um, so it is interesting to even see that it potentially has a, some positive effects on rights because again it, it is a link. So I, you know it would be interesting to tease out why if these measures are so elite focused, why, you know, is it is it then the issue that it's transforming elites thinking about women's rights and how the heck is it doing that, right? In a way that actually seems to have this effect on women. There's some stuff I just cannot figure out what the you know, what what is really going on here. I mean so I think at this point, I'm hoping that this is, um, you know, if ask more questions than it answers, I guess, really, but it kind of gets people thinking and, and maybe, you know, what you guys are talking about then helps maybe to find some areas of research to you know, go down those paths and 
investigate some more. So the only thing I can think of, but your question is interesting, making me think more about that now is, um, yeah, what, what, how is this working on the leads, right? Because a lot of these changes, if you're talking about governments changing, um, so again, it's government respect for human rights. So laws are being changed, um, and not just political laws. I know you focus yeah. on the political, but economic laws. So right. now, you know, the Taliban come to power. Now women cannot work in the public sector, right? Uh, that is a change in law that affects women, right? Um, but then other regimes come to power, and now women can, or are even encouraged, or, you know. Um, so, so, you know, where are those laws coming from? What role do elites play in, in the transformation of these laws? Um, and those elites can be women, too. Again, in Afghanistan, the, the, these amazing women at the head of these um, um, uh, uh, civil society groups, you know, um, they were women pushing for, for a lot of this stuff, so. No coup in Chile was preceded by women who were marching through the streets the pans, and being, being protesting in inflation. Pans who yeah. would protect us from the social yeah. justice, right? right? So, a very, very similar sort of logic to yeah. a different, different set. Uh, in the back. Yeah, uh, my name is Kate. I interned for a genocide watch. So, you spoke a little bit about uh, how you were able to look at regions after Civil War, but when they re entered Civil War, if they re entered Civil War, um, you kind of stopped and then you picked up again after. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the transformative effect of the nature of women's rights after re-entering, like how it was after. Yeah, I don't, I don't code for that. That's, um, that's a really, you know, so you could look at what effect um, if they had multiple civil wars might that have, right? One of my hesitations um, or one of my problems is that the second thing I'm looking at, the N is so low, I just can't put a whole lot of variables into the model because it you know it's just it's just too many variables I mean we're talking about with the social rights and then of 200 and some and with the others 300 and some so I'm, a, I'm somewhat limited in, in what I can do in every model I mean I guess I could try and run so I could try to run a model where I look at you know um, maybe take another variable out and put that one in and look at whether repeat civil wars because that is an interesting question I mean if I'm arguing that it's transformational. What does it repeat? So is that ultra transformational? I don't know. Or you know, I don't know. It's a good point. Anyone uh, have any other questions? Sorry. Sorry, I have another one. Um, just thinking about it um, at the framework level. I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, but like organic transformation versus kind of inorganic, like imposed. So something like a peacekeeping operation we've talked a lot about in class is. Um, are they kind of imposing maybe a Western liberal mm -hmm. idea down? And so you see this change, if you, you know, because of that, or you see this kind of like talk about that because of that, as opposed to where things like population, right? There are no, there are not that many young, young men, so you kind of see this push for women to join the workforce. That's very organic, right? It's, it's a natural thing. So is, do you think that's worth making a distinction, or? That's really interesting. That might be a, a this thing where I look, try to look at, um, I did it with, sorry, let me go back here, where I, um, <laughs> where I do this hyperbolic transformation, right? And I did that with respect to just, if it ended in a negotiated settlement or a civil war. That might be interesting and say, all right, maybe peacekeeping has, you know, maybe you should discount the effects of peacekeeping over time, right? Because that's maybe one of these sources of Western um, ideas coming in, et cetera. Maybe you should, uh, maybe I should do it to mediation, right? Because maybe they're the, I mean, mediators are pushing democratization, for example, right? Yeah. That's one of the big places it's coming from. Um, so maybe if I do that, you know, that, that might be, that, that's sort of one way I could think of maybe kind of teasing that out. Um, I'm not enchanted by including, again, military outcomes, at, sorry, victory and negotiated sum in the model. Oh, what do you think? I mean, Western aid? I mean, I'm trying to uh, yeah. the, in, the inorganic uh, side here is sort of Western aid or IMF programs or World Bank programs. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, you've done a lot of work in IMF, and so, so but I'm I wondering. Don't expect some, those to yeah, no, I, 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 I wouldn't either. Like I wouldn't either. Right, but, 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 yeah. but, but there is so some something, right? Sort of maybe the, the, yeah. uh, some other proxy for the impact of westernization well Western uh, Western so Western. one thing I had was and I you know you can there are arguments about the extent to which globalization is westernization oh, oh, but sure. I did have economic globalization in 
and it, it, it's uh, positive across the board on women's rights, uh, but only significant for economic rights. There are also the KOF index is what I used for that, so there are also measures for social and political globalization. I could try those alternately. In fact, maybe, for example, I should be using that for the economic the measure for political globalization for the political, I That's don't know, an and a measure idea. for social for the social, right? That's a very interesting idea. Though, think so? I, wonder, I wonder if that thought might yield yeah. something. And so, along the lines of the yeah. uh, again, with, yeah, with you look at the measures, I'm a little leerier of their political and social one, but it's things yeah. like IKEA. Uh, so, I mean, they are, they're, they're very Western-centric, right? But number of McDonald's, number of IKEAs, number of that, that's like actually that. always been my criticism of that measure, yeah. but actually it plays exactly into okay. this discussion. So Ikea was so their attempt to make it less U.S. centric. It's like, wow, okay, Ikea, you know. Right. So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and again, so I would say maybe there are little shreds of stuff in there that address what you're saying, but not, not fully. Okay, well, uh, Barb, more questions. Um, thanks a lot to Caroline for coming, and thanks for our audience for attending. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the